Good morning, this is Dan McLaughlin, and today we're going to read Chapter 12, Waterloo, from Funny and Farsi. Um, something new this time, I'm on the questions, I'm going to give you the number of the paragraph that you can find the answer. So check that out. And if you're uh, reading along on the, the Google Doc, you might look at the questions first and then play the video, and you might find the questions uh, and to be answered easier. So here we go. Money and Farsi, Waterloo. Um, here's some little vocabulary and phrases. I am the Christopher Columbus of my family. The father was saying that he was the first one to do something, like Columbus was the first European to discover American, though even that's probably not true. But it, it's kind of a, was a common myth at the time. There's a picture of classic Christopher Columbus discovering uh, the new world. Progressive man, that means someone that's in favor of new ideas, someone that's ahead of his time. Perfect track record, that means a record of actual achievements and success. Uh, spellbinding tension, that means a fascinating drama within a story. Riveting tales, riveting means that you are glued to the, the storyteller, listening to that storyteller. Um, stories that were attention grabbers, but she's being sarcastic in this sense, okay? So here we go. Uh, and this is all about swimming. Think about for a minute, how did you guys learn how to swim? That'll be a question at the end. How did you learn how to swim? Uh, I can talk about that live, but um, it's an interesting story. Uh, so my father is a proud man. He is the first member of his family to study in America, the first to win a Fulbright scholarship, and years later, the first to settle permanently in America. Because of him, his siblings and their families ended up in Southern California, where they all live within a half an hour of, each other, of one another. I am the Christopher Columbus of the family, he always says. Uh, nothing, however, has made my father as proud as his role as the family swim instructor. In Iran, people learned to swim on their own if they learned at all. My mother, like most women of her generation, never learned to swim. Neither did four of her five sisters or her brother. This was the norm. My father, always the progressive man, decided that every one of his children and his nieces and nephews would learn to swim. Abaddon, having been built by the British, contained many luxuries not readily found in other areas, including a clubhouse with a large pool. Every summer, my relatives came from all over Iran to stay with us, and sure enough, it was always some child's turn to learn to swim. Like a game show host announcing the next contestant, my father would say, this summer, it's your turn, Mahmoud. My father had a perfect track record, a topic he loved to talk about. I have a gift, he'd always say. We had all resigned ourselves to having to listen over and over again to his description of the exact moment at which each niece and nephew learned to swim and the spellbinding tension leading up to it. Mahmoud said, Uncle Kazem, I cannot do this. And I said, yes, you can. And he lifted his arm like this, and I pushed him a little bit, and he kicked like this, and he started to swim like a fish. So I said, hey, you never told me you knew how to swim. He'd always end these riveting tales by telling us, you should have been there. We were all glad we hadn't been. The stories were interesting the first 14 times, but beyond that, they became the equivalent of the neighbor's vacation slides showing the cathedrals of France from all angles. Unfortunately, there wasn't much anyone could do to put an end to these tales. Each new swimmer represented a victory. And talking about it made my father relive his moments of glory over and over again. The twinkle in his eye, the excitement in his voice, the pride in his face, all made it clear that my father would never stop 
retelling his stories. So <clears throat> what are the, here's some questions. What are some reasons for Farouz's dad? Um, uh, for, what are some reasons Farouz's dad said he was the Christopher Columbus of the family? What was Farouz's dad most proud of? And what made Farouz's father's stories so boring? Okay, next section. Now remember, you can stop and, and look for the answers for those questions and then restart. In this section, we have a phrase, I was my father's Waterloo. So Waterloo was Napoleon Bonaparte, great general in France. It was his worst defeat. So the author is saying that she was like a battle that he could never win. And there's a little video about the Battle of Waterloo if you're just interested in about world history in general. How was the battle fought and whatnot. Methodical matter in an orderly and systematic way. So there we have a rug weaver weaving a rug. And if you look, this is pretty amazing. It's, it's, that's the thing that she's working on. It's called a loom. And they make, a, they make that pattern one line at a time. And so it's very methodical. That's why I put that up there. Uh, buoyancy, the ability to float. And there's a picture of someone being buoyant. A cerebral approach. Cerebral means of the mind. It's deep thought. Your cerebellum is the main part of your brain. That's where cerebral comes from. Anxiety. I think we've all felt anxiety, nervousness. And there's a phrase here. The British never appreciated Gandhi's persistence. And my family didn't appreciate mine. So Gandhi, and there's a picture of him there, persistently protested against the British until they left India. And the author is saying that she was as annoying to her family as Gandhi was to the British. So he was very famous for his nonviolent protests, which eventually gained India their independence from Britain. And there's a little video on Gandhi if you're just you know, interested or curious about them. And the word Pavlovian, this is a fascinating word and concept. Pavlov was a behavioral scientist. He studied behavior. His experiment was to ring a bell each time a dog was fed. <clears throat> so then soon, so in other words, you uh, dogs, when they eat, they salivate, they start drooling, okay? So he'd ring a bell each time they ate. And then soon, he, just by ringing that bell, the dog would start salivating, even though was, there was no food there. So he was anticipating the food. So in the book, Feruza finds that if anyone mentioned the word swim, it would make her dad angry at him. Like it was like ringing a bell. And there's a phrase, clinging to him like a koala on a eucalyptus branch. Eucalyptus is the kind of tree koalas live on. And there's a koala there clinging on for dear life. All right. So history, however, has shown that shown us that even the greatest of generals must eventually face defeat in battle. And thus was carved my destiny. I was my father's Waterloo. My father, an engineer, had an entirely logical approach to teaching his students to swim. In a methodical manner, he would explain all the necessary ingredients in swimming. Your head goes like this, thus creating buoyancy. Your feet go like this, thus propelling you forward. Your arms go like this to steer you. You put it all together and you've got it. Hear him, hearing him explain it made swimming seem as easy as baking a Betty Crocker cake from a mix. You just add water, and there you go. The cerebral approach worked on all my father's swimming students, Oops. Uh, most of whom, not coincidentally, grew up to be engineers. I, however, needed something else. I've never been interested in exactly why an airplane can fly. I want to know if the pilot has had enough sleep. In learning to swim, I just wanted to know that I wasn't going to die. My father, however, never quite understood the role of anxiety in my fruitless swimming lessons. 
he eventually decided that perhaps if he yelled or hurled insults, I might learn more quickly. You're like a rock. You're hopeless. What's wrong with you? This method may work wonders in the army, but it didn't work with me. I now had two hurdles to overcome, fear of water and fear of being in the water with my father. After a couple of summers worth of lessons, I had managed by age six to learn nothing, setting an all-time failure record for my father. In hindsight, I believe my ability to dodge all learning opportunities did reveal a certain inner strength, a persistent refusal to be like others. But the British never, ex never appreciated Gandhi's persistence, and my family didn't appreciate mine. My father eventually decided that we didn't actually have to be in a pool for him to get angry at with me for not knowing how to swim. He started to have a somewhat Pavlovian reaction to me. If anyone used the word swim, my father would glare at me with a combination of shame and anger, a look that said, I wish I had kept the receipt. To save face, he had come up with a theory of why I couldn't swim. She's built like a rock, he'd always say. She just sinks. This wasn't entirely true. I had never actually, I never, I'm sorry, I had never actually let go of my father in the pool, preferring instead to cling to him like a koala on a eucalyptus branch during an earthquake. His determination to peel me off himself matched, but did not exceed my determination to hold on to him. Okay, so why, why was Feruza, her father's Waterloo, when it came to teaching his kids how to swim? Uh, what did Feruza's dad not notice about her? Not notice about her. And how did Feruza survive in the pool? So we have some vocabulary for the next one. Moi, that's French for me. C'est moi. It's me. Um, deity, that's a god or a goddess. There's a bunch of uh, Hawaiian deities there. Kanaloa, Kane, Ku, and Lono. It's really interesting how abstract the uh, Hawaiian gods are. Epigee of civilization. So the epigee, actually, it describes also the flight of, let's say, a rocket. Or if you throw a rock up in the air, epigee is the highest point. And so in this case the highest point of a civilization. So I, I, I put a little picture there of uh, Tokugawa era Japan, because everybody would probably put like Rome or something. But Tokugawa is kind of an epigee of uh, Japanese civilization when you think about uh, old Japan, anyway. Uh, accruing the magnetism. Now, magnetism is kind of like star quality or attractiveness. And I just put a picture of James Dean uh, from Rebel Without a Cause, you ever see that movie? That's an awesome movie. Yeah, I think it's still a good movie to watch for teenagers today, even though there's no swearing in it. Um, but uh, accruing means getting the magnetism, getting the this attractiveness, growing. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> so sadly enough, my father stopped talking altogether about his glorious swimming lessons. He knew that no impressive tale could match his one big failure, moi. He finally announced to the world, which consisted of my aunts, uncles, and cousins, that some people are incapable of swimming. Beruza is one of them, he had concluded. When I was eight years old, we went to Switzerland to visit my aunt Parvine, my mother's sister. Parvine, and I don't know if it's Parvine, Maybe it's Parvine. Hmm. I'll say Parvine. Aunt Parvine has always been considered something of a deity in our family because she managed, despite being an Iranian woman of her generation, to become a doctor and to set up a successful practice in Geneva. The woman overcame so many hurdles to reach her dream. To Oh, my goodness. Uh, the woman overcame so many hurdles to reach her dream. Oh, my goodness. 
that she deserved to have her likeness carved in mo marble. I'll fix that up later. The fact that she actually lives in Switzerland further adds to her allure. I should have put that up there. Allure means attractiveness. Iranians have always considered Switzerland the epogee of civilization, a small, clean country where bus drivers don't have to check for tickets since everyone is so genetically honest. Besides, Switzerland has never particularly welcomed Iranians, thus accruing the magnetism that only comes with repeated rejection. So she's saying the fact that uh, they got rejected so, so much uh, actually um, made it more attractive to them. You know, sort of like if you're really interested in a certain person and that person keeps rejecting you, sometimes it, 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 that person becomes even more attractive to you. Uh, so what was special about Aunt Parvine? And why did Iranians think of Switzerland as the epogee of civilization? Okay, moving on. To intervene, to get involved or prevent or alter events. There's a little picture of the goddess Athena uh, turning Odysseus, the returning hero, into an old man so that he can uh, spy on his wife and her suitors. So the deity is intervening uh, on Odysseus's behalf. Like a wild flower blooming in a battlefield, like something beautiful growing within a horrible situation. There's some flowers growing within a World War I trench. And to acquire is to get, and I think there's probably some other stuff that I should have put on there, but here we go. Aunt Parvina told my father that she was going to teach me how to swim. My parents decided to leave me uh, with her one afternoon while she worked her medical magic. It didn't occur to them that perhaps they should stay and watch the swimming lesson. My aunt took me to the deep end of the pool, and there, this highly educated woman, whom I'd grown up worshipping from afar, let go of me. I sank. Perhaps because of her medical training, or perhaps because she couldn't face the prospect of having to explain to my parents that she had killed their child, Parvine eventually decided to intervene. Moments before, I got to see the tunnel with the light at the end and the angels beckoning me to join them. She lifted me out of the water. My aunt dragged me out of the pool and doing her best imitation of General Patton, in a bad mood, announced that I was hopeless. When my parents joined us, she announced, Feruza is a rock. The new news of my European failure soon reached the rest of my relatives, thus cementing my reputation as the one incapable of swimming. Oddly enough, no one questioned my aunt's method of instruction. She was, after all, a doctor in Switzerland. My near-drowning experience brought with it an unexpected ray of hope, like a wildflower blooming in a battlefield. My family now was now completely resigned to my inability to swim. My father no longer insulted me. Instead, he treated me with pity, since now he assumed that I was missing the chromosome necessary for buoyancy. His pity often led to trips to the toy store, thus proving I, that I was far smarter than my cousins. I managed to acquire eight new tea sets while my cousins had merely learned to swim. Okay, there's a reference up there to General Patton, who was a very famous general in World War II. But, you know, that's one thing I missed. Uh, he was a fascinating character um, and very controversial as well. So what... Best describes Aunt Parvine's method of teaching Feruza how to swim. Now, also, make sure that you have that Google form up there because it it's multiple choice. You might be able to just get it, you know. And what was one advantage of not being able to learn to swim? All right. Yes, this one starts off with a saying, and I love this saying, actually. Most fruits, if left alone on a tree eventually do ripen. 
So she's kind of saying most of the time, if you just leave people alone, they'll develop on their own. And, you know, it's, it's always a case of how much of that, how much leaving alone do you really want to do as a parent or as a teacher? But people often do get it together by themselves. Proviso, that's a condition as part of an agreement. You know, with one proviso, I must have only, uh, I must have all the brown jelly beans taken out before you give me the jelly bean bowl. No, okay, whatever. Um, Cer Cerulean, and I hope I'm saying that right. Anyway, it's a deep blue color, and there's a color of cerulean blue. Here we go. Most fruits, if left Oh, no. Okay. Most fruits, if left alone on a tree, eventually do ripen, especially if they're not being yelled at. It was thus that I, at the age of 10, decided I was finally ready to learn to swim. There was, however, one proviso. I wanted to learn to swim in the sea by myself. I proudly made this announcement to my father, who... Once he start, stopped laughing, said, you never learned to swim in the pool, so now you want to go drown in the ocean? That summer, we headed for our annual week-long vacation by the Caspian Sea. Because of work commitments, my father was unable to join us. My two brothers, my mother and my aunt Sedige, and my uncle Abdullah, and their four sons who knew how to swim, courtesy of my father, headed north to the Caspian. Once we arrived, we went straight to the beach. I took a few steps into the water, where a gentle wave lifted me and I started to swim. It was sim simple as that. When we returned to Abadan, I proudly told my father the news. He did not believe me. He and I headed straight for the pool, where he watched in disbelief. You, Furuza, he said, shaking his head are an odd child. No, I said. There was nobody yelling at me in the sea. Years later, when we moved to Newport Beach, I discovered that one of the greatest joys in life is jumping from a boat into the deep blue Pacific Ocean. That was before I discovered snorkeling in the crystal clear waters of the Bahamas with sea turtles and manta rays swimming around me. Later still, my husband introduced me to the cerulean waters of the Greek islands, where I spent hours swimming in the hot Mediterranean, Mediterranean sun burning on my back. But despite my dips in the many beautiful bodies of water in the world, I have never forgotten that first gentle wave in the Caspian Sea, the one that lifted me and assured me that, yes, the pilot has had enough sleep. So we have the final bunch of questions. Um, what does the phrase, most fruits, if left alone on a tree, eventually do ripen in this context to Feruza? Where does Feruza end up swimming? And why do you think Waterloo was chosen as the title of the chap of this chapter, Your Own Thoughts? And that's that's not anywhere that you can find it in a paragraph. What is why does she choose that as the title Waterloo? And the last one is just a short answer. How did you learn how to swim? All right, thank you very much. Sorry about the little glitches there, but it's just an idea. So you can come back to this if you missed it, or maybe it helps you read along. All right. So I hope this helps. Talk to you later.